this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You may be seated. You say, that was a scripture reading last week. You're right. Way to pay attention. It's on purpose. So it's been a blessing for us to have Colin home from college and to be working as an intern for us uh, before camp begins in about a week. So it's his last week in his internship. And what a joy it is to be raising up our young people to want to serve the Lord in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but in his case, especially in youth ministry. So he's been preparing for that. We appreciate Mike working with him, showing him some of the ropes, teaching him some lessons. Um, one of the things we did want him to experience while he was in this internship was an opportunity to preach. So uh, next Sunday morning, we'll have that opportunity to hear from him, so we can all look forward to that. You might pray for him. That's a, that's a challenging thing for a young person to step into, but he'll do a great job. Looking forward to it very much. There's a classic joke or dig that uh, preachers endure, and it's, it's the joke that's on this cartoon here. little guy runs up to the preacher and says, when I grow up, I want to be a preacher just like you, because you only have to work one day a week. Whenever that's said, of course, the preacher and the person laughs, because they both know it's not true. They're just jesting. Most people realize that ministry isn't easy at all, right? That, that ministry is, is very difficult and requires a lot of work and involves a good bit of criticism, a good bit of sacrifice and suffering, and that's true of those who are in the full-time ministry, but it's true of anyone who does any kind of ministry at all, including ministry volunteers. Few Christians in any generation have suffered from criticism like uh, Charles Spurgeon endured. And, and some of this was inevitable. Spurgeon was you know, so well-known, so, so famous. And he was criticized for his teaching. He was criticized for his motives. During one stressful period, he wrote to a friend saying this, Friends firm, enemies alarmed, devil angry, sinners saved, Christ exalted, self not well. Have you ever served to the point where you could say that? Self not well? How much responsibility are you willing to shoulder for the sake of Christ? How much time and energy are you willing to invest in the ministry of God? How much of your money are you willing to sacrifice and give to support the work of God? How much ridicule or criticism are you willing to put up with for the name of Christ? These are penetrating questions. I think they're important ones. They either confirm that we're on track in our service for the Lord or... They convict us, perhaps, for our lack of dedication in our service to the Lord. You know, it's helpful, I think, to be reminded periodically of what Jesus said, that He made it absolutely clear during His ministry that the path of discipleship, the path of ministry, is not easy. It's difficult. And so He said in Luke 9, 23 and 24, If anyone, are you anyone? If anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. So these are questions we need to ask ourselves. Am I daily picking up my cross and following Christ? Am I really losing my life for Jesus? Is Christ and His church really the center of my life? The most important thing in my heart? Or is it really just one of the extra things I've added that make me who I am? What I hope we can be reminded of today is that every person who is truly pleasing to God is a person who gives themselves to the Lord in service, and sacrifice, and even suffering. So I want to help us evaluate whether or not we're doing that in each of our own lives. And to do so, I want us to return 
to the story of Paul that we've been looking at and to pick up his story in Acts chapter 14. So if you'll remember from the past two sermons in our series, um, we've been looking at what's called Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, the Holy Spirit had sent he and Barnabas from, from Antioch of Syria, and they went off to uh, Cyprus, first of all, and they ministered on both ends of that island, both the east and the west ends. And then they sailed on to Perga and went up to Pisidian Antioch, where they spent a few weeks in ministry. And then they were expelled from that region. So today we pick up their journey after leaving Pisidian Antioch. They traveled about 90 miles southeast from Antioch to Iconium. So Acts 14, the Bible says there beginning at verse 1, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. And there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles. So how interesting is this that they first go to the synagogue. Now, wait a minute. Don't you remember as they left Pisidian Antioch, what were they saying? Because you've rejected it, we're no longer going to the Jews. We're now going to the Gentiles. But they go first again to the synagogue. So in saying that their ministry was going to focus on the Gentiles didn't mean that it wasn't going to involve the Jews at all but their focus would be on the Gentiles. And of course, when they go into the synagogue, who do they know they're going to find there? They're going to find some Jews who will believe, and they're going to find some God-fearing Greeks, some Gentiles who had gathered with the Jews, who will also likely come to faith. So we're told they spoke so effectively that a great number of both Jews and Gentiles believed. And as you always expect... Those Jews who don't believe are going to stir up trouble. They're going to oppose them. In this case, they poison the minds of these people against Paul and Barnabas. But amazingly, in spite of that, they stayed there a considerable time. And they spoke boldly. And the Lord confirmed their message by signs and wonders, which was the purpose and reason for signs and wonders in the New Testament time, to confirm that they are indeed uh, the spokespersons of God. Now, I think this is a good lesson for us to learn right here. Paul and Barnabas didn't run away from challenges in their ministry, but they stayed there in spite of them. So because there was such opposition, they stayed there a considerable time. You know, Henry Ford said, obstacles are those frightful things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Let that sink in just a minute. Obstacles are those frightful things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. We must learn to face our challenges in a way that transforms them from obstacles into opportunities. And the key to being able to do that is our attitude of faith. You know, when we wake up every morning, we choose the attitude we're going to have that day, right? We choose the attitude we're going to carry with us. And then every waking moment, we choose the attitude we're going to employ in every situation. Is that attitude going to be an attitude of faith, is the question. I believe our best attitudes emerge out of a clear understanding of our own identity. That it's rooted in God. That, that we have this, this divine sense of ownership and a divine sense of calling and empowerment. See how that changes our attitude when we know who we are and whose we are and the power of our God? And as we'll see, that's the kind of remarkable attitude Paul and Barnabas consistently, consistently maintained throughout their ministry, which enabled them to overcome countless and extreme obstacles. 
and faithfully stay focused on the goal of being faithful to God and serving the Lord. So let's return to the story. We'll notice that the opponents made some plans to stone Paul and Barnabas, but the Lord allowed them to discover the plan and, and allowed them to escape. The story continues there in verse 5. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Now, in Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had the faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So they travel to Lystra, uh, about 18 miles southwest of uh, Iconium, and they encounter this lame man, crippled from birth, had never walked. Paul looked right at him and saw that he had the faith to be healed. And I can't explain what all that means necessarily. But he saw that he was interested. He saw he had a faith in God. He, and maybe he saw that this man would attribute the healing to God and be a good witness of the power of God. I don't know. But he saw that and he healed the man. The man jumped up and began to walk. This guy who had never walked. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there at that moment? Wouldn't you have liked to have seen that guy's face? The joy, the exuberance. The episode is certainly reminiscent of some of the, the healings of Jesus and another apostle, Peter and John. Let's see how the crowds respond to this miracle. The Bible says there in verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So how does the crowd respond? When they see this miracle, they shout in their language, the gods have come down among us. Now, why would they have such a quick reaction from one miracle to assume that the gods Zeus and Hermes had shown up? There's a little bit of history here that might give you some insight into it. There's a legendary history in Lyconia that Zeus and Hermes had visited that city one time in the past, years ago, and no one in the land gave them any hospitality except two old peasants. And those gods, Hermes and Zeus, wiped out everyone else in the city. The only two that remained were the two old peasants. So, with that memory or story in mind, maybe that gives some insight into why they're so quick to assume the gods have visited us again. They didn't want to make the same mistake that those folks had made the other time, right? So they roll out the red carpet. and They, they get ready to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Now before we see how Paul and Barnabas respond to that, let's, let's pause here a moment and consider a potential danger in ministry. What a tempting moment this is for anyone in ministry. What a tempting moment for a preacher or, or some other person ministering for someone to say, you're like a God. Right? Anytime we make a difference in someone's life, serve them in some way, they have a tendency to begin to look at us in that way or begin to depend upon us in a way that makes us a little God in their life. Not the big God, but, but a little God in their life. And when that happens, it's so easy to let it go to our heads. It's so easy to begin expecting and needing that kind of adulation. But not Paul and Barnabas. 
Let's see how they responded. The Bible says there in verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. So once they picked up on what was going on, it probably wasn't too hard. I don't know if they knew the Lyconian language or not. Probably not. But it was pretty obvious these guys are going to worship them and offer sacrifices to them. So Paul and Barnabas put a stop to it immediately. And then he begins to preach to them. And it's a short message that we're told here. But it's interesting, he didn't start with the Old Testament like he does in the synagogue. He starts with God, the creator and the giver. He talks about how, how God has, uh, has cared for them and provided for them and that this is the one true God. It's a similar message you'll see when you get to Acts 17. And he speaks to the people there in Athens who have all those different gods and even the, the idol to the unknown God, right? So Paul and Barnabas did the right thing. They did not welcome the adulation of the people but pointed people to the only one worthy of worship, to the one true living God. But the people hardly listened. And they continued to try to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. But here's another good lesson for us. Popularity can be very short-lived. The story continues in verse 19. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. How quickly things change. One minute you're a god, the next minute you're being stoned, right? Right? The crowd goes from singing praises to slinging stones. Welcome to ministry. One minute you're taking the bow. The next minute you're dodging tomatoes or worse, stones. Isn't it amazing the enemies of Paul and Barnabas would come so far? to Go to such extent. They come all the way from Antioch and Iconium. All the way down there. We're talking 130 miles for some of them. Six or seven days of walking all day long. They turned the crowd against Paul and Barnabas. The crowd stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, left him thinking he was dead. I don't know when you hear that or read that, if you say, well, what about Barnabas? Why did he not get stoned? Well, maybe Barnabas is really fast. I don't know. And he ran quickly. I I don't know. Or maybe they only stoned Paul because he was the spokesman. Remember back earlier, they, they called Barnabas Zeus and they called Paul Hermes because he was the spokesman. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But can you imagine being so hated that people would literally pick up stones and hit you with them till they think you're dead? That would be a crazy experience. Don't you marvel at the courage and commitment of Paul. So, so did the stoning actually kill Paul? We don't know, right? The disciples gathered around him. I'm guessing maybe they were praying over him for his healing. The fact that he suddenly gets up, you know, boing, and goes back to the city kind of has a, a, the flavor of a miracle, but we don't know. But again, you marvel at his courage and his commitment. Would you have gone back into the city where you were just stoned and dragged out of? I probably would be heading on to the next one immediately. But think of how a deed like that would have more effect than a hundred sermons, right? When they see him going back to that city, 
and the people there realize he'd gone back to that city, this guy's in it for real. He believes in what he's involved in. The story continues. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby, and they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. So the next day, the day after being stoned, Paul and Barnabas left for Lystra. They traveled to Derby. Now, if what had happened to Paul was not a resurrection from the dead, it's miraculous in that he's ready to travel, right, the next day. 60 miles to Derby. The journey probably took several days. But they preach the good news there. They have great effectiveness. A large number of people become disciples. And isn't it amazing? They just kept on ministering without a beat. Right? Stone one day, moving on to the next city the next day, just staying at it. Persecution, suffering, whatever was not going to stop them. A ministry that's ultimately effective is one that perseveres through periods of enormous difficulties. Servants of God aren't fickle. They don't need the applause of people. Faithful servants reject being enshrined as gods. They do God's work. They deliver God's truth. No matter the jagged edges or perilous threats that they face. Faithful servants don't throw themselves pity parties. They don't retaliate against those who persecute them. They just entrust themselves to the God who's called them to serve. And they keep on serving. What great examples. So the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas continues with these words. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They backtrack, right? Strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So they retraced the journey of that first missionary journey, stopping at each city, meeting with those who had become Christians. This is good follow-up, right? This is good ministry. You don't bring people to Christ and then drop them and ignore them. You go back and you keep ministering, grounding them in the faith. And look at the message. The message they gave them as they came back through. Discipleship equals suffering. Serving God is not easy. We're going to have to go through many things. And can you imagine the impact that would have coming from the mouth of Paul and Barnabas? These are guys who've been thrown out of every city that they're going back through. Stoned almost to death in one of them, right? We must go through much suffering to be faithful to God. Okay, we get it. Thanks for the example, right? And these are the words we must keep in the forefront of our own thinking. We've got to remain true to God no matter how hard the journey gets no matter how difficult the ministry becomes, we're serving a faithful God. The first missionary journey ends with these words, verse 27, on arriving there, back at Antioch of Syria, right? They gathered the church together, reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So back where they began, they gathered the church together, and they report all that God had done. And, and notice how the emphasis is on God. It's not here, Paul and Barnabas. Look at how great we are. We're awesome servants of God. Look at what God has done. Look at the doors God has opened. It's all about God. It's not about us. And you know, the church must always be ready not only to send people out into mission, but then to welcome them back and to hear the stories of what God has done through those who were sent. We should be anxious to hear from those we've sent. We should be anxious to hear from the Bentleys about what's going on there in Tanzania. And Lord willing, this next uh, winter we'll have a chance to hear from them how things are going. We should be anxious to hear from the Hope family um, 
orphanage that we support, the good work going on there. We should be anxious to hear from John Otis, who we've been supporting down in Pennsylvania. And we may have a chance to hear from John here recently. He's left that work. He's come back to New York. He's taking care of his 92-year-old mother. So uh, hopefully we'll hear some of the good things from him. We should also be anxious to hear from each other. Every time we come back together on Sundays or Wednesdays or any other time during the week, should be anxious to hear what God is doing in each of our lives. What doors God's opening, what opportunities He's giving, who the people He's, he's brought us in touch with that we're trying to, to, to draw towards God, right? What prayers that we've been praying together that God has answered. Let's be ready to share and to hear what God has done and rejoice in it. So as we bring the lesson to close, I want to remind us that ministry certainly has its highs and lows. It certainly has its joys and sorrows. It can be very hard and demanding, but it's all worth it. Someone has said there are no shortcuts to any place worth going. There are no shortcuts to any place worth going. That's certainly true of heaven. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, there has never been a man in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. There's never been a man who led a life of ease who's worth remembering. We must ask ourselves, am I really trying to live a Christian life of ease? Am I trying to find a shortcut to heaven? Do you really think God will consider me a faithful disciple because I attend worship assemblies regularly? Is that really all God's looking for from us? No, true discipleship is so much more. As Jesus said, and we mentioned early in the sermon, we must take up our cross daily. And follow Christ. And a daily life of a true disciple gives real attention to their Lord and will result in, in study and, and service and sacrifice and suffering. But all of this is a labor of love. And all of this fills us with joy. Joy of knowing we're God's. And knowing that God has eternal rewards for us. And the joy of knowing that we have been given the right to serve and even to suffer with and for Christ. I want to share some words with you as we end. These are some powerful words wit written by a woman named E. Margaret Clarkson. So send I you. I put this in your, your handout so that you could have it. <clears throat> so send I you to labor unrewarded, serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing, so send I you to toil for me alone. So send I you to bind the bruised and broken or wandering souls, to work, to weep, to wake, to bear the burdens of a world weary. So send I you to suffer for my sake. So send I you to loneliness and longing with a heart of hungering for the loved and the unknown and, the, and known. Forsaking home and kindred, friend and dear one, so send I you to know my love alone. So send I you to leave your life's ambitions, to die to dear desire, self will resign, to labor long in love where men revile you. So send I you to lose your life in mine. So send I you to hearts made hard by hatred, to eyes made blind because they will not see, to spend though it be blood, to spend and spare not so, send I you to taste of Calvary. So send I you, Lord, here am I, send me. Paul and Barnabas had that kind of call. And they wouldn't let anything stop them from being faithful to make them quit ministering in the name of Jesus. And I hope we'll follow their example. I hope we'll remain faithful in our service even when the mission becomes difficult. Keep our eyes on the goal. 
God's bright, shining light in front of us. God doesn't promise an easy Christian life, nor an easy Christian ministry. What God does promise is that He will be with us always. And that He will reward us in the end. And so let's end with these words from our scripture reading last week and this week. Such important words from the Apostle Paul. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know, you know, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're going to sing a song of encouragement if you need to respond to the invitation today. An invitation for salvation, an invitation for recommitment, an invitation for help and strength. We invite you.